Thank you for joining us today on our webinar on legal implications of climate change for professionals, uh, which is being hosted in partnership uh, through the Fraser Basin Council and engineers and geoscientists BC. Uh, my name is Elena Chia, and I also have my colleague Jim Vanderwall on the line. Um, and I've mentioned before, but if you're uh, looking at our audio options, you can listen in through your computer or you can dial in. So, so background to the webinar. Um, as I mentioned, it's organized in partnership with Engineers and Geoscientists BC and it's being presented by Zizzo Strategy. Um, as some uh, context, engineers and geoscientists BC um, have previously hosted a two-day course on climate change law uh, for engineers and other professionals. And we're following up with this webinar um, with a one-day workshop uh, on this topic that's going to be open to all professionals. Um, we, if you're interested in this event, after our webinar and our evaluation survey, we have a question um, asking to see who would like to attend and also um, a question to, to ask for your input on um, what type of additional topics you would like to see in that workshop. Uh, so this webinar is part of a series um, that's part of our BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative Program. Uh, through this program, we support local governments, First Nations, and the private sector to plan for climate change adaptation. So we do local community capacity building. Um, we host this webinar series, we have community workshops, and we also manage the retooling website, and you can see the address up on your screen. Um, through this website, we have a database of different adaptation resources, toolkits, guides, and case studies. Uh, if you're interested in our learning events um, and you want to be notified when future webinars or workshops are happening, you can subscribe to our re retooling newsletter. So if you go to retooling.ca uh, in the left hand column, you'll be able to find the subscribe button. Uh, and another resource to consider is Engineers and Geoscientists BC uh, Climate Change Information Portal. Uh, so through this portal, you can find information on adaptation networks, guidelines, case studies, risk assessments, and lots more. Um, and these resources are directed at engineering and geoscientists professionals. And our upcoming BC RAC event, uh, we have the Green Shores Policy and Regulatory Tools for Local Governments webinar coming up on November 16th from 11 to 12, same time. And our three speakers for that, we have Deborah Carlson from West Coast Environmental Law, DG Blair from the Stewardship Center for BC, and Laura Rodden from the Powell River Regional District. So that invite should be coming up within the next two weeks. And if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll be hearing about it. And some webinar logistics. Um, we're going to keep everyone's audio muted uh, to limit background noise. If you have any questions, you can type them into the question box and we're gonna save them until the end after the speaker's presentation. And if you're encountering any technical difficulties, you can type that into the question box or you can send an email to my colleague Kim Vanderwall at freezerbasin at gmail.com. So today we have uh, Joanna Kudrizis, uh, uh, who is the policy director at CISO Strategy where she works with organizations across sectors to identify climate-related risks and opportunities and navigate the policy landscape while transitioning to a low-carbon economy. Uh, Joanna has also assisted governmental, not-for-profit, and 
international organizations in developing policies and positions on carbon policies, integrated land use and transportation planning, resilient cities and biodiversity. And a tidbit about Jonas, that she was recently invited to serve on the expert panel on climate change adaptation and resilience results, which was launched by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Catherine McKenna. Uh, the expert panel is going to be advising the Government of Canada on measuring progress on adaptation and climate resilience in order to better understand how federal, provincial, and territorial adaptation efforts are building Canada's resilience to climate change. And before joining Zizzo Strategy, Joanna uh, was practicing at a boutique law firm where she advised clients on emerging issues in climate change, energy, and environmental law and policy. And before that, she was practicing at a premier law firm in New York representing global financial institutions, major investment banks, and private equity firms in complex litigation and regulatory matters in federal and state courts. Uh, Joanna graduated from Cornell University with a degree in natural resources, and she obtained her law degree from the University of Toronto. So I am going to take a moment now to pass over the presentation to Joanna. So if you could wait for one moment. All right, thanks, Elena. Can, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna. Uh, thanks so much for that great introduction, Elena. Um, as Elena said, I'm policy director at Zuzo Strategy. So we are a multidisciplinary consulting firm focused on climate change issues. Um, although my background is was in law and I was practicing law previously, we started to think that you know just looking at things from a legal angle didn't really give us a full picture and the issue of climate change is an incredibly complex one that requires you know people from different backgrounds and disciplines to come together and and uh, join their expertise in problem solving so we started this firm uh, a couple of years ago, and we're a team of lawyers, engineers, accounting professionals, um, and many of us have science backgrounds. Uh, and we work with different organizations from public and private sector to help them understand how climate change impacts them. We have actually done a lot of work on the training and education side uh, working with professionals such as engineers, scientists, and other lawyers, and also speaking with local governments to help them better understand, you know, what are their roles and responsibilities around climate change? Um, how can they be better integrating that climate change considerations into their decision making? Uh, and really, how can they be part of the solution? You know, all of us, or for many of us, our goal is to make sure we're keeping people and infrastructure safe. All right. So here are the topics that we will cover today in, uh, in the short time that we have. <clears throat> First, we'll talk about uh, climate change more broadly and some of the impacts. Then we'll discuss legal drivers of climate change mitigation and adaptation, which I will uh, define shortly. We'll briefly touch on uh, securities disclosure and investment trends, and so that sort of brings in the private sector a little bit more and, and uh, some of the key developments that are happening around climate change in that area. And then finally, we'll uh, link it all back to professional implications. Now, this is a lot to cover, I know. Um, so I'd really like you all to see this as sort of a high level overview or sampler of, <clears throat> of how law is driving us to integrate climate change into our planning and decision making. 
and, and a brief note, in terms of the audience that we had in mind when we were developing this, this webinar, um, we, were, we were thinking of different groups of professionals, uh, and we are also thinking of those who design, manage, operate, and maintain uh, public infrastructure. All right, so I'll start off by just saying that um, climate change is here. We are already experiencing many of the impacts uh, from, from the hurricanes that we saw down south in Texas and Florida uh, to the wildfires in BC. It, we're seeing a new normal and uh, these impacts from, you know, are, are Oh, sorry, my Siri somehow <laughs> woke up out of nowhere. Um, so their impact, it, these impacts are, uh, they're, they're creating a new normal and they are seeping into our day to day. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the international authority uh, and a body set up through the UN, came out with uh, a recent report that uh, demonstrated a number of key findings. First, they found that the Earth's climate system has warmed at a rate of approximately 0 0.08 to 0 0.14 degrees Celsius per decade since the 1950s, and that this trend is expected to continue. Second key finding was that humans are mainly responsible for this change. Third key finding uh, was that climate change is linked to the strength and frequency of extreme weather events, uh, so it exacerbates these events and makes them more frequent and intense. <clears throat> and finally, something that many of us know, climate change is a global problem that requires rapid action, uh, so we need all hands on deck in order to avoid um, fairly catastrophic events. This is a chart that you, or a graph that you may have seen um, in some other presentations. It, it, show, it helps to put some numbers on uh, some of the impacts that we're seeing. Uh, so this is from the Insurance Bureau of Canada and shows that the insurance industry in Canada is one sector that is really feeling the impacts of climate change. Uh, in 2013, uh, the uh, amount of insurable losses due to catastrophic events rose over three billion dollars annually uh, and much of this was due to the floods that we saw in calgary and toronto this amount then rose above five billion dollars per year in 2016 with the fort mcmurray fires in alberta being uh, responsible for over three billion dollars of that in the recent past, it was an anomaly to see uh, annual insured losses uh, based on catastrophic events to raise above a billion dollars. Um, but as you can see, that's no longer the case. A few, a few key points coming out of the financial community. So, you know, in the past, often it was the environmental sector that was ringing the alarm bells and trying to draw attention to the issue of climate change. Uh, but now we're seeing this trickling over into the financial community. Uh, so Mark Carney, who's the uh, governor of the Bank of England and the chair of the Financial Stability Board, has been a, a leading voice on the impacts of climate change to capital markets and global financial stability. He's called climate change the tragedy of the horizon. Uh, the Bank of Canada agrees and recently issued a statement saying that climate change was one of the biggest challenges that Canada and the world would face in the 21st century. It also estimated that the cost of inaction uh, could range from 21 to $43 billion per year by 2050. Now, I know that climate change can often be this sort of bad news um, story, and so I just wanna say it's not all bad news. There's also huge op opportunities around climate change, both in terms of protecting ourselves uh, and the safety of our communities, as well as economically. 
And so the low carbon, uh, the low carbon market has been valued at over $5.8 trillion per year um, globally and is growing. Now, these extreme weather events and uh, incremental changes in the climate are translating into pretty significant impacts. Um, I've listed some here, increasing precipitation and intensity of storms, um, issues with, around permafrost and increasing freeze-thaw cycles, <coughs> more intense heat, um, fluctuations in water availability and quality. So in some parts of the country, we're seeing increased pre precipitation and rainfall. In other parts, we're seeing droughts. Um, sea level rise is an issue on the coasts. Uh, and all of these are leading to impacts not only on our physical infrastructure, but also on human health. Um, they are also presenting you know, new potential for legal liability, which uh, is the topic of this presentation, uh, all of which points to a significant need to adapt to, to a uh, changing climate. Now briefly, you might have heard these terms, climate change mitigation and uh, climate change adaptation. I'd like to take a quick moment to uh, define each of them. So climate change mitigation refers to actions that we can take to stop climate change from happening in the first place, or at least reduce the strength of, of climate change, um, which generally refers to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, or enhancing carbon sinks, uh, such as planting more trees to take carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Climate change adaptation, on the other hand, um, is based in an understanding of the fact that climate change is happening already, and instead of um, sort of pretending that it's not and burying our heads in the sand, we need to take action to make sure that our communities are uh, responding to these impacts and are better prepared so that we can mitigate any potential harm. Now, policy developments uh, at various levels of government are responding to climate change and the increasing impacts that we're seeing. At the international level, uh, in 2015, we reached a historic agreement um, where 197 parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change <coughs> came together to sign the Paris Agreement and uh, pledged to aim to reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions and uh, such that we would limit global average warming to two degrees Celsius below uh, pre-industrial levels and try to limit the increase actually even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And uh, now this is an extremely ambitious um, set of pledges and would require rapid decarbonization by the second half of this century. Uh, at the national level, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the Pan-Canadian Framework was uh, a, a big policy development coming out of the federal government. And then at the provincial level, um, each province has sort of taken a different approach. Uh, and again, we'll I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Okay. Now, three questions must be asked regarding our response to climate change. First is, what can we do? The second is, what should we do? And the third is, what must we do? For instance, what must we do legally? A number of these, a number of, uh, these slides and this presentation suggest that private and public sector entities are required to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, in terms of what we can do, much of that falls under the voluntary space. And now if you note the overlap here, um, that indicates two things. One, some of the actions that we can take involve both reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to climate change. Uh, and secondly, the voluntary space and the, uh, what is legally required 
can often interact. So, you know, certain actions might start off as voluntary, uh, whether it's uh, steps that companies are taking because they think it's in their best interest or um, you know cities that are leading and decide that they want to do smart infrastructure planning perhaps step codes that are out there that are voluntary measures and then some of these um, some of these actions end up being codified in bylaws or end up being required down the road All right, venturing into the legal drivers. Now there, there are two main sources of law in common law jurisdictions um, like most of Canada. The first is legislation. So this includes statutes, regulations, policies, rules. These are sort of top down um, rules that directly or indirectly require us to act on climate change. The second source of law is common law or judge-made law, um, which happens in the courts and um, is usually brought through litigation. And so for each, for each section, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation, I'll take you through the legislative and then the common law uh, drivers. In terms of Canada's action from a legislative point of view, uh, in the past two years, we have seen a number of, uh, a number of policies and regulations uh, coming from the federal government. <clears throat> so last fall, um, the federal government announced a commitment to a national carbon price, um, a phase out of coal-fired power by 2030, low carbon fuel standards, in December, it then released the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, uh, which is the first ever coordinated plan where federal governments, provincial and territorial governments, as well as local governments, are working together to achieve Canada's climate change targets. Uh, so the Pan-Canadian Framework is organized around four main pillars, which I've listed in this slide. Uh, the first is carbon pricing, the second is other emissions reduction measures. So that refers to climate change mitigation. The third is adaptation to climate change and increasing resilience. And then the fourth pillar is uh, accelerating innovation, clean technology, and job creation. Uh, just recently, the federal government has uh, released a few more national level kind of policies, including proposed methane gas regulations, and uh, it's working on a national zero emission vehicle strategy. <laughs> now, in terms of what these kind of top down or legislative requirements mean for local governments or professionals, often these are worded in, um, you know, very high level or uh, objective-based type ways with not a ton of guidance on implementation. Uh, so then these higher level goals end up falling on uh, local governments and professionals to come up with strategies and implementations to uh, make sure that these are happening on the ground. Okay, turning to the, the provincial scale, a lot of the climate change action that's been happening across Canada has actually been going on at a provincial level. Um, <clears throat> so a number of provinces have uh, ad adopted carbon pricing systems, whether it's cap and trade, or carbon tax, uh, or a hybrid of the two. Other provinces have focused on investments in uh, technology such as carbon capture and storage. Certain provinces have set zero emission vehicle targets. Uh, and we've also seen a lot, a lot of leadership coming from uh, the local government level. Um, Zizzo Strategy was at the ICWI Livable Cities Conference in Victoria uh, last week. And there were some great success stories about uh, different measures that local governments are taking on the ground, both on the adaptation and the mitigation side. 
Okay, now turning to litigation related to GHG reduction, uh, <clears throat> or again, this is the common law or judge-made law side of the legal drivers. This has been a very, very interesting and active area of legal developments, uh, particularly in the past couple of minutes, or sorry, a couple of uh, months. So I've pulled out a few examples here of the types of litigation that we're seeing. Uh, the first relates to forcing government action. So attempting to uh, sue our governments and, and get them to impose more stringent regulations. The most popular case example of this type of litigation is the Urgenda climate case. And so um, in 2015, the Hague District Court issued a landmark decision um, that was brought against the state of Netherlands by, its, uh, the, by the citizens. In that decision, the court held that due to the great risk of climate change occurring and the severity of its impacts, the state had a duty of care to take climate change mitigation measures. Uh, it, the court went on to find that the, the Dutch government's current pledge, or then pledge, um, to reduce GHG emissions 17% below 1990 levels by 2020 was insufficient. And the court actually ordered the state to uh, increase its targets and aim to limit greenhouse gas emissions to 25% below 1990 levels by that time instead. So this was a, a huge development in um, the world of climate change litigation and the first of its kind. Uh, a number of other lawsuits have, have followed, including one in the U.S. launched by a group of youth uh, against the U.S. Uh, government, alleging that their constitutional and public trust rights were being violated by the government's failure to address um, the rising concentration of greenhouse gases and their associated dangers of climate change. Other litigation um, around GHG redu reduction is, relates to trying to tie specific emitters, large emitters, to the impacts of climate change. Uh, in the past, these types of cases were criticized as, you know, being kind of pie in the sky because it was really difficult to prove that specific emissions uh, coming from a specific entity that were actually causing other specific climate related events. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but a few recent studies that have come out just you know over the past couple of months are making huge headway on this front where um, we've we've actually been able to narrow in on certain large emitters um, where one one report has found that you know about 90 emitters are responsible for uh, approximately two-thirds of historical greenhouse gas emissions <clears throat> and then other studies have uh, called event attribution studies have actually been able to link uh, specific climatic events such as sea level rise to those additional emissions in the atmosphere uh, so some of these findings have actually emboldened uh, a few more plaintiffs to launch lawsuits. Uh, some some uh, examples to point to are coming out of California. Uh, for instance, San Francisco and Oakland just launched a lawsuit suing some major oil companies around um, sea level rise and the damages that are associated with that. All right, what's my timing? I'll, I'll quickly mention that environmental assessment cases are another interesting area of litigation to watch um, because that provides an important trigger point for climate impacts to be considered. Um, just recently, a federal court of appeals in Denver came out with a decision <coughs> where they told the Bureau of Land Management in the US uh, that their economic analysis or their, their sorry, analysis of climate impacts related to four major coal leases was economically irrational. Um, the Bureau of Land Management tried to argue that the climate impacts of these coal leases were negligible or non-existent because if they didn't develop and produce coal with through these leases, then um, surely coal would be developed somewhere else and those emissions would bubble up somewhere else. <clears throat> 
Uh, and it, so it was very interesting that the court rejected this argument and said, we can't assume that if we if we do not develop fossil fuels in one area, that um, that development will automatically happen somewhere else. All right, uh, turning to legislative requirements to adapt to the impacts of, uh, of a changing climate. This is an area um, of law that's fairly limited. And so, you know, we're, we're just starting to see pieces of legislation come out saying um, that there's requirements to actually adapt to the impact of climate change. I pulled out two examples here, uh, a recent Ontario Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act provides that infrastructure should be designed to be resilient to the effects of climate change. Uh, there are no more specifics uh, aside from that, um, you know, no, no metrics or process uh, for those who need to um, obey by this law to actually prove that they have um, properly designed infrastructure. So again, that's sort of where professionals come in and local governments come in. We need to hammer those details out. Another example is uh, British Columbia's new Water Sustainability Act, which allows decision makers to review water licenses and <clears throat> um, require that the effects of climate change are taken into account. Um, again, not, not much more detail than that. Uh, so one, one last point about the Pan-Canadian Framework, so legislative requirements at the federal level, um, the Pan-Canadian Framework was fairly light when it came to measures to adapt to the impacts of climate change, um, but it did talk about updating building codes to increase resiliency and uh, things like that. Okay, my time, two, three. So moving to... Moving to um, negligence and common law drivers to adapt to a changing climate. This is where we really focused a lot of our attention and we find that uh, local governments and professionals are interested in, in hearing more about this. So when a plaintiff, which is a person who has been harmed, um, finds himself in a situation uh, where they have been injured, let's say their basement was flooded, the first thing that they're going to do is look around to see, you know, who can they get compensated for by. Um, they might turn to their insurers, uh, often who are not able to, <coughs> um, you know, their policies may not cover the particular damage that was suffered. They may look to their neighbors and argue that the, the way that the neighbors lawn was sloped, uh, ended up, you know, directing water to their property and causing the flooding to happen. But more and more, plaintiffs are actually looking to local governments um, who have the deeper pockets <laughs> and are arguing that they should have done more to protect um, citizens from uh, what is more and more becoming foreseeable climate-related harm. And so, here are the elements of negligence. And I won't go into too much detail here because uh, it's, it's fairly complicated legal principles to cover in a few minutes. Uh, but the main elements are that the defendant, so the, the entity being sued, uh, needs to have a duty to the plaintiff. Uh, they need to have breached their standard of care. And the actions of the defendant uh, need to have caused or contributed to the plaintiff's harm uh, in, a, in a foreseeable way. And so possible defendants, defendants that we have seen uh, being sued in these types of lawsuits are government entities, um, so that's municipal, regional, and provincial governments, uh, but they're also kind of professional infrastructure and design professionals who had a part in designing, maintaining, or operating um, the infrastructure that led to the damage, let's say stormwater management systems. We've also seen contractors and developers be sued in these types of cases. Now, the most important element of, uh, of negligence, probably to this audience, is the standard of care. So what the standard of care is, 
generally, the general rule is the standard that it's to act as a reasonable person would in the given circumstances. And so, you know, we're not asking um, defendants to act perfectly. You know, we're human and accidents happen. All we can do is act in a reasonable way. Now, this is fairly amorphous, and uh, the court decides whether or not a defendant met the standard of care on a case-by-case -case basis. But factors that inform a court's decision-making uh, are listed here. So the first is industry standard um, or, or customary practice. You know, what are others in the sector doing? And did, did you act similarly? The second factor is statutory requirements. And so is there a related statute that describes how, you know, the Ministry of Transportation should act or a utility should act in the given circumstances? Uh, if one does exist, that doesn't necessarily determine the common law standard of care, uh, but it does help to inform it. Uh, the third point here is the standard of care is the standard at the time of the act. Um, that is being claimed as negligent. And so if, you know, um, if a stormwater management system was designed in the 1970s, uh, but then there was a major uh, flood causing damage in 2010, we're not going to look at, you know, what are the standards in 2010? We're going to go back and see, and see was the, the system designed to the standard at the time in the 1970s. Of course, there might be other questions around uh, requirements to update and maintain that system. <clears throat> uh, but in the end, all of these factors come together to try to inform this concept of reasonableness in the circumstances. Uh, now, a quick point with respect to professionals is that there are a few examples when we're not just looking at sort of the average Joe or Joanna standard of care um, and instead, there, there's a, the standard of care is a little bit tweaked. And one of the examples um, is in the case of professionals. A number of professionals, including lawyers, engineers, doctors, um, are, are uh, held to a, a heightened standard of care that is based on the, uh, the typical confident, competent individual in that class of professionals. Okay, so just so that you know, I'm not uh, making this stuff up. Um, we've seen a number of class actions uh, following major flood events, mostly following major flood events, but um, this could happen in other climate related, following other climate related events, uh, where citizens are coming together and they are bringing lawsuits against their uh, municipalities or provincial governments. I'll, I'll just tell you about a few examples uh, here. So one is the city of Stratford. After a major flood in, uh, in the city of Stratford in 2002, many were left with sewage in their basements and uh, damage caused to their homes. So plaintiffs came together and claimed negligence in the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of the city stormwater management system. Um, after how many years? After eight years after the flood. <laughs> so that's eight years of the city having to pay legal costs to defend itself in this class action. Uh, the city of Stratford settled for $7.7 .7 million. Uh, and this is after already spending $1.3 million in immediate emergency relief following this event. Uh, and then you know, after the settlement, they also went on to um, spend, you know, a, a certain amount on improvements to its system. And so to point to this case, you know, yeah, we, we usually bring up this case to show that there are a number of ways that the costs can really add up. So even in this case, the court didn't find that um, the city was negligent on its merits. It didn't get that far. It stopped at the settlement uh, stage. Um, but the legal costs and emergency response and infrastructure repairs all, all added up to a pretty significant sum.
One other example that I want to point to is the farmer's insurance case. Uh, so that's coming out of um, the U.S. in Chicago. <clears throat> uh, in and around April of 2013, Chicago and, and some of its surrounding counties experienced a major flood. Um, a group of insurers then came together to sue the city and some of those counties, arguing that the mid-April rainfall was reasonably foreseeable in light of climate change models. Um, and so the city should have taken steps to prevent that sort of damage. Now, the reason that this case, the reason that this case is um, important to point out is that this is one of the first cases that actually mentions climate change in the analysis and arguments. Uh, so many of the class actions that we have seen around flooding do not directly point to climate change. It's just, you know, an extreme weather event occurs and they're looking to be compensated. Um, but the farmer's insurance case shows that with updated climate change science, knowledge and understanding, uh, with new models, what counts as reasonably foreseeable is starting to change. And we all need to make sure that we're keeping up to date with this information and then acting accordingly, you know, discharging our roles and responsibilities accordingly and updating our, our standards of practice and our policies and planning accordingly. Uh, in the farmer's insurance case, they actually referred to Chicago's climate change action plan as evidence uh, that, that some of the defendants had already accepted the fact that climate change does increase the intensity and frequency of rainfall in the area. All right, I'm nearing the closing. Oh, so let me let me point to this really quickly. Uh, in terms of in terms of the insertion points for claims of negligence, often we will automatically think about the, the original design of the system and whether that was sufficient. Um, but many of these cases don't go all the way back to the design stage. They'll actually look at um, various stages of upkeep and management of the infrastructure. So um, permitting an, ex an inspection could be found to be negligent if a permit was issued um, when it perhaps shouldn't have been given, <coughs> given known climate um, impacts or projected climate impacts. Uh, enforcement could also be negligent. And so there was a, a case where uh, the city of Thunder Bay uh, came up with a bylaw requiring downspout disconnection and decided that that was going to be a sufficient measure to protect the communities from flooding. When a big flood then did occur in, in uh, the city of Thunder Bay and the city tried to argue that it made a policy decision and so was immune uh, from negligence, the court found that, yes, you did make a policy decision to enact a bylaw to require downspout disconnection, but then you didn't enforce that bylaw, uh, and so you were negligent there for a lack of enforcement. So these are these are some of the ways uh, that defendants could be held to be neg negligent. A key point here is that uh, historical data can no longer adequately predict the future, and so we need to be updating our practices our policies, uh, and, and also updating our tools to better understand these risks and manage them. Quick slide to show you know, the, the process of this updating and continuous review and updating uh, to incorporate climate change information. Uh, now I'm running, I'm running short on time, uh, but I would briefly like to say that in the private sector, there has been a lot of action around increasing transparency and reporting around climate related risks. Uh, so legally, under Canadian securities law, publicly traded companies are required to disclose certain material information to their investors. And now this could include information related to environmental and climate change risk. The guidance around this is very limited, however, and, and most companies aren't doing this. 
there has been a huge push by um, the fin Financial Stability Board launched this task force on climate-related financial disclosure, which you might have heard of. Uh, it's chaired by Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of, uh, of New York City. And the mandate of this task force is uh, to help organizations better uh, measure and report climate change risks in their mainstream financial reporting. And so they've organized their recommendations around uh, four key groups, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. And uh, this has created a lot of waves in, um, in the private sector, even though these are voluntary recommendations. Come, you know, as soon as one company says that they're going to incorporate these recommendations, other companies in that sector are also um, a sort of pressured to do the same. And here's a slide just showing kind of the rapid uptake of these disclosure uh, expectations and increase of uh, climate change related risk in company reporting. And the very last point here shows that the Canadian Securities Administration, it, it, Canadian Securities Administrators um, announced in March of this year that they will be reviewing climate-related disclosures by uh, Toronto Stock Exchange listed companies. And so here's another example of where a voluntary initiative uh, is, is starting to veer more into the required or regulatory space. Um, and other countries are also, I think France, uh, for instance, has come out and said that they are moving towards mandatory requirements around integration of this task force's recommendations. And now, I understand that this is more related to uh, the private sector space than um, the public sector, but the reason I bring it up is, first of all, that it's, it's receiving a ton of attention in, in the climate change world and shows that um, you know the private sector is also moving on this file. Uh, but it's also important to professionals and um, the public sector for two reasons. Number one is that in order for companies to be able to disclose their climate change related risks, uh, they first need to understand what they are. And so you know, professionals in um, risk assessment and identification can help those companies figure out what their climate related risks and opportunities are. And then secondly, um, there, there's also a huge emphasis in the public sector on transparency and measuring progress on our climate change targets and reporting that to the public. And so we can, we can learn from, uh, from some of these initiatives and carry over some of these metrics and recommendations into the public sphere as well. All right, so key takeaways here. <clears throat> Climate change is uh, redefining risk, both in terms of the types of risks we're seeing uh, and how we need to be managing those risks. Uh, it's also uh, kind of reshaping the legal landscape and, and changing potential for legal liability. Governments and professionals will both be called upon uh, to, to help craft and implement solutions that will help to meet our climate change goals and satisfy the requirements requirements um, that are coming top down from legislation. Various actors, including governments and professionals, uh, could also be on the hook for increasing climate related liability. Uh, and so we need to revisit our current practices and standards in order to make sure that they are sufficiently updated in light of a uh, changing climate. Overall, uh, we need to draw on our collective expertise and uh, multidisciplinary thinking to you know, come up with solutions to this issue and keep our people and property safe. All right, I think that is all. Oh, last is professional implications. So here's a few ideas of just, you know, how can we achieve, um, how can we achieve some of those things and be a part of the solution? So promoting up-to-date climate-related information and data, uh, considering, current levels of preparedness in our projects and our planning, working to, under, to ensure that our, that our standards and practices are consistent so um, we can show that we're 
working towards meeting our standard of care, um, and then drawing our technical expertise to, to develop strategies and integrate climate change considerations into our day-to-day -day decision making. All right, that was a lot to cover, and we have 10 minutes remaining, uh, so happy to take some comments or questions. All right, well, thank you so much, Joanna, for your presentation. It's really excellent and interesting. Um, and I see there's a few questions coming in, uh, but as I want to give some people time to, to think about their questions, uh, we have two polls that we would like to ask um, in related to the, the one day workshop that we're, uh, that we're interested in. So I'm just going to launch that right now and give people a chance to, to think about that. So the, our first poll is about um, which of the, the following topics um, uh, you would be interested in seeing in a one day workshop and you can select more than one. So I'm going to close off that poll and share the results there. So you can see that we've got um, more even distribution in, in the last three topics and less interest in the, the legal drivers to reduce emissions. So that's good to know. Um, thank you for that. And the second poll we wanted to share is this one on um, whether in a workshop you would prefer um, more in-depth implications for a specific group of professionals or if you're interested in a cross-disciplinary workshop. All right, so with that, um, it's also a, a pretty even split between the two. Uh, so thank you everyone for filling out uh, those poll questions. And then I'll look into our, the first question we have from the audience um, from Pamela Sevet is focusing on the standard of care and reasonable aspect uh, what is your perspective on potential liability for biology professionals who fail to provide advice around in climate change impacts um, where it's essential to reduce risk and harm? Um, thinking about regulations like the riparian areas regulation um, or certifications related to development permitting uh, habitat mitigation. Um, and, uh, and some food for thought is that there's no explicit legislative requirement under the College of Applied Biology's Code of Ethics requiring specific proficiency in adaptation and mitigation standards. And it's likely that many accredited biology professionals um, don't have the expertise to provide advice in the first place. Um, that's a great question. We uh, have not come across any litigation incorporating biologists, but certainly, you know, that's one area of experts and, and professionals who would be uh, feeding into kind of policy and decision making. Uh, the one point that I really want to get across in terms of the standard of care is because, you know, this can really um, <laughs> this can really incite fear in, in a lot of the people that we talk to is that the standard is not one of perfection. It's, it's truly one of, of reasonableness and, uh, you know, an average level of competency in your group of professionals. And so, so long as you're, um, you know, thinking, thinking it, so long as you're conscious and you're, you know, documenting your decision making and 
you know, thinking about climate change data and projections, um, then all you can do is do your best, right? All you can do is advise based on your expertise. And a lot of times, you know, all of us are going to be wrong. Uh, and that's, that's not going to necessarily mean that you'll be found negligent. But the best thing that you can do is, is to try to keep up to date with, uh, with data and document your decision making to show that there was sort of a thoughtful process that you took to get to the final um, advice. Uh, and, and again, in terms of there not being um, kind of legislative requirements or a code of ethics, um, yeah, it does. I, ha I guess that does leave you a little bit more in the dark in terms of what what you're expected, um, what standard you're expected to um, to meet. But those legislative requirements and codes of ethics aren't determinative, and so you know. It's, it's not a sure thing that even if you were to meet those that you won't be found negligent. And that's, I mean, that's a bigger discussion that um, we could go into, but that's a great question. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, we have a question from Susan Hayes who has recently read an older article that talks about how mitigation and adaptation are morally different and that the former has global impacts while the latter is um, only protects locals. And she's interested in your thoughts on this and how it can relate to um, legality and risk. That's interesting. Um, well, that that's, yeah, certainly they're, <laughs> certainly they're two uh, different approaches and you know, a number of uh, practitioners in, in the climate change space are more and more trying to promote actions that can optimize both mitigation and adaptation outcomes. You know, there are going to be trade-offs in certain cases, um, but, you know, an example is uh, increasing green space in the middle of the city is at odds with, um, or can be at odds with more compact development. And so it, it might increase, you know, kilometers uh, traveled if you have a huge park <laughs> that you have to get around. Uh, but meanwhile, that park has, you know, adaptation benefits of uh, flood mitigation. In, in terms of the, yeah, in terms of the uh, local impacts versus international impacts, I think the discussion around tying specific emissions, well, first of all, the Paris Agreement, and then also these uh, scientific studies that are working to tie specific emissions to specific climate events are kind of making the world smaller in a number of ways. And so on the, on the mitigation side, I don't, yeah, I, I don't see, I don't see, the, you know, North American emissions not being able to be tied to harm in developing countries. We're sort of seeing that we're all in this together and uh, we all have a responsibility to, to protect communities locally and abroad. It might be harder to bring litigation in those cases, <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but yeah, I, I believe the studies, these reports that are coming out are, are really helping to tie certain actions with outcomes, uh, even if they're not in the same locale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, Joanna. Uh, our next question from Carrie Barron is, how will the amendments to the flood hazard area land use management guidelines, um, which as, is effective October 1st, affect local government legal responsibilities? Um, the language relates to should consider, not shall or must. Interesting. Well, I think, um, you know, if it's, if it's just a should consider, then perhaps you, uh, Perhaps it's not a clear legislative requirement, but it will certainly factor into the standard of care. Uh, a best, you know, best practice guides as well as legislative requirements are both considered by a court in determining the standard of care, and uh, and neither one is determinative. They both inform it, so they're sort of in, in a com from a common law perspective, should and shall are almost of equal weight. Mm. Uh, but it's great to see that those those are being updated. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I'm trying to encourage through this presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we have time for one more question um, from Loni Pierce. Uh, how much does the government approval of a professional's plan mitigate the risk of their liability 
or ability to be found negligent. Interesting. So one one issue we didn't go into depth in in this presentation was that the government, in certain cases, the government decisions are immune from negligence claims if they can show that they are policy decisions versus operational decisions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I think government approval um, could help to could help to reduce the risk of liability to a professional, um, but. First of all, a government could also get sued and then could bring that professional in and, you know, they could both be defendants in the same case. Uh, and secondly, a government could um, could argue immunity and then try to turn, you know, the fault back to the professional by saying that they relied on on the professional in certain cases. So it's it's not clear. And I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say that if you have government approval on a plan that you're safe <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. From, from common law negligence? Mm -hmm. okay. Good to know. Uh, so one point raised by Amanda Broad is uh, I had mentioned that the effective date for the flood hazard area um, land use management, those amendments, is October 1st, but that is actually um, being reviewed uh, to allow for adequate notification. So no longer October 1st for everyone to know. Um, and we have a, a few more questions that we unfortunately won't have time to get to, but I can uh, touch base with Joanna afterwards and, and back to the audience to get those responses out. Uh, so I want to say thank you so much, Joanna, for your time and for delivering such an excellent presentation. Um, we really appreciate your, your efforts and, and being here with us this morning uh, to speak about this very important topic. Thanks so much for having me, Nina. Okay, goodbye everyone.